But I think the thing that really uh, turned me out was the um, the Beyonce video, Single Ladies. <laughs> seeing seeing Beyonce and a leotard in high heels like broke me. I was like, all right. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. So... uh, You've probably heard me say this already, but I have a fairly straightforward relationship with religion, and that is, I don't have one. I didn't grow up religious, I never really messed around with religiosity when I was moving into adulthood or at any stage in my life, and it's just really never appealed to me, so I've just kept away. So, straightforward, right? Well, not exactly. I think... Where I have struggled the most in the past with religion is when discussing religion with queer people who happen to be religious. And I think I've always struggled with this notion that you can be two things at one time. (sighs) I don't know if I'm explaining this right. I guess it's that, you know, it comes as no surprise to anyone listening to this, that religion tends not to be too favorable to queerness and taking that one step further kind of damning towards queerness and so i guess it just confused me that someone could be both queer and proudly religious when there were all of these myths and hatred perpetuated by religion Hmm. but i think my views have changed You know, as I get older, I recognize that religion can be really powerful and useful for people. And then on top of that, I suppose, there's the fact that it's none of my business if you want to be religious or not. So why don't I just stay in my own lane and keep out of your business? Anyway, I'm telling you all of this because I had a really interesting conversation this week with Crystal Cheatham, who is the CEO and founder of the Our Bible app, which is an app for progressive Christians that Crystal created after she got a little fed up, I guess, that's the polite way of saying it, of the homophobic BS that was being peddled by other more mainstream Bible apps. And we caught up to talk about the Lesbian Bar Sisters, which was in Philadelphia, and which she started going to when she was just a little baby gay, just coming out of the closet. And I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. I personally got a lot of insight and a new perspective on how someone can hold both religious views alongside their rampant, inherent queerness. And uh, yeah, why don't we just get into it rather than listening to me ramble? Okay, let's go. What's the most outrageous thing that's ever happened in a lesbian bar? Oh, my God. I don't think that's even fair. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd start us off on a light, easy question, you know. Oh, uh, you know what? The first and only time I've ever been in a bar fight has been in a lesbian bar. <gasps> Wild, right? <laughs> Who started it? You or them? They did. And it was quite random. There was um, some very aggressive butch woman going around and just hitting on all the feminine presenting people in the room. And a lot of them were partnered or like standing next to a girlfriend and (laughs) just, just terrible. And I was with a group of people and one of my friends got angry and was like, you're annoying my girlfriend. And um, that instigator immediately got kicked out. But shortly after we decided that we were going to leave, you know, we were like, the mood is ruined. Let's go find a different gay bar. And um, we're outside and, 
these people, this person and her crew are down the block and they are following us. And by the time they catch up to us, it's just a brawl in the street. And I remember looking up and there is a drag queen in a window yelling and screaming and cheering it on. (laughs) <laughs> oh, oh, so, so not being the voice of reason, being like, no, yeah, get him. No, just just <laughs> like loving it. Um, but yeah, eventually we got out of there. But yes, crazy, crazy. Lesbian oh, bars are not peaceful places sometimes. That would make a good painting though, I think. I can totally the see image it. image of you yeah. in the street. Yeah. Mm. If I had mm. any skill, I would illustrate it. <laughs> but, and so what is the lesbian bar that this happened at? Sisters? Sisters, Yep sisters yeah so tell me about sisters sisters was one of the first exclusively gay places that i entered when i first came out as a lesbian and moved to philadelphia i found it compelling because as someone a recent grad who was also in grad school i had absolutely no money and they would have this thursday night special where you could come in i think before 10 o'clock and you could pay 10 bucks and they would give you four, I think four drink tickets and you had to use them between 10 and midnight. Oh, that's not too bad. Oh, it was not too bad. It was outrageous (laughs) because the drinks were basically just water bottles full of liquor, you know, like, and like as, as a young adult, I was like, I'm getting my money's worth. And I think that every lesbian who has lived in Philadelphia and passed through Sisters has a crazy story about a Thursday night. I am not lying. (laughs) But yeah, it was just a really good, it was a great stomping ground. It was a great place to just kind of like see new people, understand new identities and kind of stretch into one's own sexuality. And I don't know, I genuinely miss it. Okay. So let's go back a bit and paint a picture of the crystal that just showed up in Philadelphia. Mm. So you moved from somewhere else. You moved for grad school. I moved from Michigan, um, where I did my undergrad, you know, back to my mom's house. And then I moved into the city. Um, Oh, okay. So you're from the area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was doing a low residency program out West. So I was living in Philly and flying back and forth between Cali and Philly. I know. (laughs) I was also singing. So I was living off of gigs and Mm -hmm. true artist riding my bike everywhere. But I had just come out like, like maybe a half a year, a year ago when I first um, encountered sisters. Like I was, I was a gaby. Yeah, I was a little baby. Fresh out the oven. What, what, so how old were you? I was like 23. <gasps> yeah. And so, um, I never quite know how to ask this question without sounding really offensive, but <laughs> why did it take you so long? Why? I was, I was super religious. And I mean, I think the religious part is definitely why it was so hard for me to mm-hmm. come out. And I think I'm naturally just a late bloomer. So... I was a uh, born and raised Seventh Day Adventist, and then went to Seventh Day Adventist schools. Um, my last one was in Michigan, Andrews University. And um, when I came out, I was just kind of shoved out of that religious space, and really learned that there wasn't any room for me there. And moving to Philadelphia was my way of of finding out, you know, the other side of me. You know, who Crystal Cheatham was outside of religiosity. And in moving, were you like, right, I'm leaving religion behind or I'm going to explore what religion can mean for me now? Yeah, when I came out, there was not a single part of me that thought the dogma is correct and God doesn't love me. (laughs) You know, I saw it as these ridiculous rules don't fit how I know God to be, so I'm going to figure out who Crystal Cheatham is as a lesbian. Um... So yeah, I I still go to church. I freaking love my church. And I've continued to work in in faith spaces up until now. And and so figuring out who Crystal Cheatham is as a lesbian, and again, placing yourself in the mindset of who you were then, 
was that like, yeah, I'm going to go and figure it out? Or, oh, I, I better go and figure it out? Uh, I don't even know. I remember having like somewhat of a, of a moment where I was standing at the end of my mom's driveway and I had really just come out to her and she accepted it pretty well. And I just had this like mental vision of, Crystal, you could you could backtrack and go down this path of remaining a Seventh-day Adventist and you could get married and you could just live out this life, you know, and it would be Ooh. so easy. And then I saw this other way that was like, I could reimagine everything that I've ever been taught and just kind of own it for myself. And that unknown, gnarly path was just so compelling that there, it wasn't really a question, you know? It was just, mm. I have to find out who I am. I have to find out what the next step is. So I think I was compelled forward more than more than anything. So like a, I have to do this. Yeah, yeah. It didn't feel like there was any other way. Uh. It's kind of like when you get the ick, you know? When you're in a relationship or you have like a huge crush on somebody and finally... Like you see something and you're just like, that's not it. And it's like an about face. It's just like something that sh- just shuts. That's exactly what it was like when, you know, I felt this huge rejection from my church and I really saw something in them that was that was repulsive to me. And I knew that was not the way. Um, and everything else I knew about being queer, though it wasn't much, was so much, much more inviting. And it has continued to be that way you know, ever since. Mm. How, and how do you m- marry the two? Sorry, that is such an expansive question. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You're an expansive like, man, I know it. <laughs> sorry, that's too big a question to answer. I guess, okay, let me put it like this. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're going to a church, you're sussing a church out, you're seeing whether or not they want it. What part of yourself do you push down? That is interesting. I mean, it took me a really long time to reconcile my faith side and my queer side. And at at times I do feel like I do a lot of code switching. Mm -hmm. Um, But along my journey, I discovered some very affirming churches and very affirming doctrines and theology. And for me, (laughs) I'm just upset that I didn't grow up with it because it's been around for quite a long time. I think nationally we get this sense that religion and queer spirituality mix like oil and water, but (laughs) I just, I don't know how you have a sexual experience that isn't spiritual. For me, they are one and the same. Um, I've had a few. So, I mean, if that's the root of it, everything comes from there. So, um, Mm. yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if the question that I asked has quite been answered. When you're on this driveway and you get that feeling and you're like, okay, I could go this path, I could go this path. It was obvious which path you were going to go down, but was it like a strident, emboldened crystal or was it like well, I guess this is what I'm going to do now. (laughs) No, no. The other path was shoving down this butt of something that I had finally decided to hold on to, to recognize in myself. And the other path was letting it bloom, finding a place to plant Mm -hmm. it, you know, um, of discovery of everything. And I've always had an adventurous heart, and so that's obviously the the direction that I was going to go in. And I don't think that that is common for a lot of people who come out or think about coming out older, at an older stage, at a later stage. Um, Wait, wait, are we saying 23 is old? Please don't tell me we're telling 23. I think 23 (laughs) is is a late stage to start grappling with with your sexuality, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. In that context, maybe. Especially now, Gen Z, like everybody in, in preschool is a they, them. So, <laughs> come on. You're at danger of sounding very far right when you say things like that. So, like, <laughs> Oh, am I? 
I think that it's cool. I'm not saying that it's bad. Oh, okay, yeah. cool, good. Just that we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, no, I am not far right at all. Let me tell you. Yeah. So you've 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 reconciled. You've come out to yourself. You've come out to other people in your life, and you're like, I'm gonna explore the scene. Mm-hmm. And was sisters top of the list? Oh, I mean, Philadelphia is quite a welcoming and affirming city for queer folks. I mean, we are a refuge for trans people and trans rights. We are, we have a, a humongous, beautiful neighborhood. We have an LGBTQ affairs office and the mayor's office, you know, like mm-hmm. we take gender identity and orientation very seriously. And so when I moved here, I automatically found my home in the neighborhood. The first place I started working at was the gay bookstore and actually the oldest gay bookstore in America, Giovanni's Room. Um, I worked there for about two years. And during that time, you know, I had literature at my disposal. I had, you know, I was I was volunteering at the LGBTQ Community Center, William Way. I, you know, started working with queer youth at the Attic Youth so, Center. So just wait, wait, wait. And so what is the timeline between you coming out, getting a job in a gay bookstore, starting to volunteer for different gay charities? It was all or nothing. It was all just or nothing. You threw yourself in. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So you weren't like, oh, just try this out, just see how it goes. I was so, no, I was so curious. Like the thing about (laughs) being a fundamentalist is that you have an entire community and a network and a lingo and a speak. You have everything. And I had gone from kindergarten all the way up through college with this community. And so to matriculate out meant that I had this huge hole to fill. You know, I had to find my people. (laughs) And that's what I was doing. I was constantly out at everything. And I think that was the best thing that I could have done for myself. Oh, wow. Is that wrong? No, no, it's not wrong. No, 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 sorry. Uh, Would you classify yourself as an extrovert? (laughs) No, I'm very much an extrovert. But I'm a performer. So, you know, I would have these intense mornings by myself. And then at night it was all right, I got to go, I got to go find people that I identify with. I have to figure out how to love a woman. I have to um, better understand what it means to be Christian and gay. You know, I had all of these, these really serious questions to answer for myself. Um, Well, and so when you're in a bar, are you the person that just goes and talks to anyone and is very friendly? Give me two drinks and yeah, I'll talk to anybody. (laughs) So on a Thursday night by about 11, is that what you're saying? I mean, maybe even 10, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. (laughs) Um, We've kind of talked about religion and how religion isn't always that friendly Mm. for queer people, but we haven't talked about the opposite and the stigma that queer Mm -hmm. people can have about religion. Did you experience any of that? in your early days of coming out and networking? Um, yeah, I think that the queer community is not not there yet, you know, in a space where we are ready to embrace this, this side of our culture that has just been so volatile mm. to us and caused trauma, repeated trauma over and over and over again. And I think early on, I realized that it wasn't going to be something that I automatically volunteered to people. Um, honestly, it felt like a lot of times to to be in queer spaces meant that I couldn't be a Christian. And to be in Christian spaces meant I couldn't be that. And it made me furious, so angry. And that anger I carried for years. And it's honestly why I was able to do the work that I have done. That work led me to work with a nonprofit called Soul Force. Mm -hmm. And we went on a two month bus tour. And we went to like some 38 schools and well, universities that were that were very conservative, like like John Roberts or Liberty University. Mm. All of these places that are just like so anti-gay that when they find out you're gay, they expel you and they hold your transcripts, right? And so we 
had a group of like 20 of us. And for two months, we went to these universities. We demanded audience with their provost, with their president, with their student government. And we talked to them about how hurtful their their policies against their LGBTQ students and staff were. We held sit-ins. We, you know, stood outside and, and like passed out pamphlets. Like we were a nuisance, but we also had intelligent debates with them about what they were doing. And honestly, I could not have done that work if I wasn't so furious at the content that they were disseminating, that conservative Christians were disseminating, not only in the U.S. and at these schools, but like around the world, (laughs) Mm. that gay people are terrible and God hates them. And here are the eight clobber texts that, that kind of back up these ideologies. I mean, yes, for a long time, for a long time, I felt that there was no air between my two identities. And we left that tour thinking that like, We hadn't really made a change, but since 2012, like so much has happened over the past 12 Mm. years. Um, Yeah. I want to pick up on what you've been saying about being driven by anger and fueled by that. Mm. Like that's something that resonates with me because that's something that I think happens to me. But there's only so much you can get to with anger, right? I feel like anger... When you have it in you, it's kind of like uh, its own fire and you have to let it run its course. You know, for me, there was no tamping that down because I felt like I had been lied to. I felt like I had been tricked. I felt like a part of my life had been taken away from me because of the fundamentalist BS that I had been taught and the things that they were continuing to teach after I knew for a fact that these Bible texts didn't mean what people told me that they meant, mm. that I could be who I was and and still feel comfortable walking into a church. I was furious and I wanted to fight back. And for me, it really did have to run out. I'd had, I had to do the work and eventually I got to a place where my anger didn't fuel me. Yeah. But what happens when the anger runs out, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Isn't it good when the anger runs out? I don't know, because there's always still so much to do, right? Yeah. You know what? I'm not angry enough anymore that I need to go to the picket line and scream at people. Mm. I feel like I am I am very much comfortable where I am and doing the work that I get to do with our Bible app, with my podcast. I I feel like I don't have to fight anymore. I can just exist. And to me, that is that's ultimate peace. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we've talked a lot about fighting today. Generally, I like to hear more about smooching and flirting. Sorry, I'm an Aries <laughs> and I'm all about fire and passion. So. Well, fire, fire and passion I'm here for. I want to hear about smooching and flirting and figuring things out with women folk. So you've come out at 23, mm. you've started going out on the scene, you might not have time for dating because you're too busy working and volunteering and networking. <laughs> in but can you talk to me about oh, like God. the the first time you got that tingle with a woman? Oh, that might have been before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it had been happening my entire life and I just excused it as deep friendship, you know, and my friends were did not. Really deep friendship, yeah. Want he did not want to be that accountable to a friendship as I did. I was like, we are tied at the hip. I don't know why you keep betraying me. And they're like, bitch, we're just <laughs> we're just friends. You know, don't sit so close to um, me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we cannot share the same sleeping bag. In a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess you know, like growing up, I had been like kind of like niggling or fingering, no pun intended, fingering this thing about women. And my dad died when I was 15. And I think that that really stunted the way that I pursued my sexuality. I mean, when my dad passed away, I just stopped thinking about it altogether until college. And in college, 
was when I started to figure out I don't like dating men. And I used to always say, I want to marry my best friend, but all my best friends were women. And so, you know, the thing started to like, like tick tock in my head. And the last thing that I did before I left college was I fell in love with one of my roommates. And I didn't think that I, I didn't know that that's what that was. And me, LaToya and this guy, Feedy, were in like a, like a love triangle. LaToya was in love with Feedy. Feedy was in love with men. <laughs> And I was in love with LaToya. It's more like a quadrangle, isn't it? <laughs> Who were the men? I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> mm, yeah, it was, it was not functional. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I don't know what happened, but LaToya stood in front of me one day and was like, you're gay. And I was like, shit. <laughs> I was like, oh, she saw wow. it. She saw it. She saw it. Because I thought, you know, I'd like, I knew it in the back mm-hmm. of my head, but I didn't want to know it, you know. But I think the thing that really uh, turned me out was the um, the Beyonce video, Single Ladies. <laughs> seeing seeing Beyonce in a leotard in high heels, like, broke me. I was like, all right. Uh, <laughs> there is no turning back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was no turning back. What? So I want to just explore this a bit more, that when LaToya had said this to you. So on one level, you knew, you knew, but on another level, you weren't accepting it. Well, it scared me. It scared me that I could be, finally be that vulnerable in front of anyone, let alone myself. Mm. You know, I think that uh, introverted people can be secretive. And for me... That secretiveness was my my internal world was everything, and seeing that on the outside scared me a lot. But once it was out, it was mm. out. There was no taking it back. It was just like a relief, a breath of air. Like yes, this this is what that is. This is what that is. Okay, what what is that? What is it? You know. And did you just sit with that for a while, or were you? quick to then want to start telling other people? I am one of those people that like when I find (laughs) something pretty and shiny that I like, I just want to tell everyone about it. Uh, So everyone had to watch Single Ladies by Beyonce, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone had to watch Single Ladies. I find a a shiny thing and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. (laughs) I found the coolest thing. Um, And so, yeah, I immediately had to tell some friends and then I told my mom and my mom pressured me to tell my brothers, which wasn't very hard. And suddenly, like, my entire um, extended family knew and it was just, all right, Crystal's the dyke in the family. (laughs) How did that feel, saying it out loud? Oh, my God. Don't even get me started. I, um... It's, you know, it's kind of like, um, like closing your eyes and having somebody put something in your mouth and you're just like, oh, what is this? You know, and you're exploring the textures, you're exploring how salty or sweet it is. And then suddenly it comes to you like, oh, this is this kind of ice cream, whatever. And so that's honestly what it felt like was slowly getting to realize what the flavors were. Each time I said it was just one more affirmation that this is who I was, Mm -hmm. you know, and seeing myself reflected in other people's eyes and understanding what they thought that word meant to be gay started to to sculpt my identity as as a lesbian. Yeah. Mm. And this is where Sisters comes in as well, being Mm -hmm. in a, Mm -hmm. a lesbian space. Do you remember the very first time you ever went there? I cannot remember the first time I went there. I mean, Sisters just makes like this impactful statement in your in your memory. There were pictures of like cat women. There were pictures of like Wonder Woman and Batwoman making out there in the bathroom. But I don't remember the first time I actually went to any gay bar. But, I mean, for the rest of my life, I'll never forget sisters. Okay. So you don't remember the first time. If you were going to describe sisters to me in five words, what would those five words be? The first time I got a woman's number, sisters. 
Wait, that's more than First five. Time woman's number. <laughs> <laughs> like sitting here counting. What? <laughs> No, that's five. That's five. No, the first time <laughs> I got no, a woman. No, it's not five, but we'll go with it anyway. <laughs> it's crystal math. It's, it's crystal math. <laughs> Why don't you tell me about this first time you got a woman's number? Oh my gosh. So I actually had queer friends, lesbian friends by this time. And I was I was so scared. I was so scared of women. You know, I know that I have three brothers and I know that when they were younger, they would... They had friends that would jeer them on about hitting on women and, you know, feeling the rejection and then getting the, hey, buddy, it's all right. You do it again, right? Just Mm -hmm. like roll over, get back up. I never had that, you know? And so I was so self-conscious and terrified to talk to a woman and then get shot down. And I just, I felt like a gawky, pubescent person all over again. Just like, how does it all work? (laughs) But in your mind, were you like, I have to be the aggressor? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. I don't know. Because, <laughs> well, I flip, I flip between the two, but I think when I was young, I was like, I'll just wait for them. And then I was like, okay, they're not coming for me, so I better like learn how to do the flirting myself. <laughs> oh, no, I, I think that on my end, I don't have the the game to just like will somebody to come over to me, you know. Like I have, I have <laughs> no wiles, no womanly wiles. It's just be direct, go ask for what you want. Yeah. Oh, and is that your approach? Are you direct? You're not like, hey, great weather we're having. Uh, I think that I I've got the chat. I've got the chat. I like to I like to talk somebody up a little bit. See if there's any chemistry, and if not, you know not, what I'm like, going to suggest whatever. now, don't you? What? Role play. Don't do it. No. <laughs> I'm not that cool. Oh, okay. But so you would just like sidle up to someone and be like, "Yeah," and just like riff. The first time, I'm pretty sure that my voice was just shaking, <laughs> and she was just staring at me like, "Oh my god, this is adorable. <laughs> Look at this baby gay." I don't know. So this first woman then, do you remember Mm. what happened? Yeah, I got her number and we went on a few dates. And it's pretty wild because I found out that um, she was a stripper. And so she had a stripper pole in her room. Amazing. It kind of blew my mind. I was like, (laughs) what is this world now? You know, I'm discovering so many things. And I think, you know... One of the breaks between gigging in Philly and doing classes in in LA, we kind of broke up. But it was a it was a cute little little romance, you know. It was it was nice. I still remember her name. Yeah. <laughs> but but do you remember that first conversation that you had with her at Sisters? I mean, I remember her just being sweaty from dancing. <laughs> And I remember the dance floor at that point just being half empty. You know, people had just kind of moved on. Everything closes at 2 a.m. in Philly, but after that, there's only one club that's open. And so it must have been around that time that people were filtering out to try and get into Voyeur before, you know, the entrance fee went up. And, yeah, she was just super sweaty, and my friend kept telling me to, like, just go over there, just go over there. And I would just stare at her and stare and stare and stare. And finally, I just, I went up and just asked her for her number. There was no, like, no chat, no anything, (laughs) just, hey. Give me your number. I think you're cute. (laughs) (laughs) Would you want to hang out with me sometime? This is so embarrassing. Why are you doing this? You're you're, you're enjoying this, aren't you? This is terrible. Yes. (laughs) Oh, my God. I was such a baby. Well, And so was she your first ever like date, like official date? I mean, with a woman, of course. Oh, she was my first everything. She was my first everything. <sighs> it was great. It was wonderful. I was so shy. Yeah, but those anticipatory so feelings before a date, oh, they are so wonderful. Oh, my God. Are they? Oh. You like that? Well... They're terrifying. That like sick in your stomach, I want to throw yes. up feeling. But but all of the like possibilities that lie ahead of you in the evening. 
I think I've just got a really good imagination. <laughs> They're going to fall in love with me immediately. We're going to have this amazing night. They're going to sweep me off my feet. You're romantic. But not anymore, because it, like every time that I imagined that was going to happen, it didn't. <laughs> yeah, no, people really disappoint you. I, I mean, you disappoint yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, all the time. There sh- yeah, there should be like a class at school that's like expectation management or something. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, American schools teach you nothing. Mm. (laughs) Teach us how to flirt. (laughs) Well, I don't know. Because there's this... This is going off topic. There's this interesting American cultural thing that kids are taught... I feel like kids are taught to be more confident than other countries in America. More forward... Yes, I would say, especially than the Brits. Oh, I don't know if forward is the word I'd use. Because if, like, have you met a Dutch person? No, but that's awesome if Dutch people are forward. Yeah, they're, like, super forward, but, like, in a really serious way. Mm, okay, I see what you're saying. I think with Americans, it's this kind of self-belief. I mean, the American dream, you know. mm, mm. mm. But Brits are just very self-deprecating. Apologize for sitting too close or for breathing on you or mm. for wearing the perfect thing. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like, wh- why is everything an apology and why is that the, the trendy thing to, to say? Well, no, I don't, I don't think know. it's the trendy thing. I think it's just that, like, British people are socialized to be like, don't stand out. Don't think you're better than other people. Don't. Just don't. Don't make a fuss. Americans are like, (laughs) you know, I get this picture of, you know, the school of fish all swimming in one direction and then there's one red one swimming in the other Mm -hmm. direction. Like that is what Americans are taught in kindergarten is to stand out, is to be explosive, is to just like, you know, be the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's why, yeah, I have that perception. How did we get here? What are we talking about? I don't, I forget what we're talking about. (laughs) It's your fault. You're the host. Oh no, it's my responsibility. Mm, 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 mm. Hmm. When we talked earlier about religion and you knowing, I just need to go and find better people to practice my religion with rather than Mm. feeling cast adrift. How, what's the journey been like over the years, marrying your sexuality with your spirituality and being bringing those two identities together? It happened with my work. It happened with our Bible app. Mm-hmm. And um, honestly, I was somebody who liked to read daily devotionals or have a meditation every morning. And there was another Bible app that I was using. And it was really frustrating to constantly have to navigate around them using demonizing homosexuals and demonizing pregnant women and demonizing all of these people that, right? That I just, it was frustrating. In a Bible app. Like, here's your morning prayer homosexuals suck, love God. Right. But they would be like, you don't want to be a sinner like the homosexuals. And I would just be like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. And I emailed that Bible app and I said, hey, there's so many other progressive authors that I had met through my work, through working with Vanderbilt Divinity School and, you know, Auburn Seminary. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, I could send you some of those names. And they wrote back basically, fuck off. (laughs) And that that pissed me off. And I started a... um, I started a Kickstarter and an Indiegogo, and I raised money to start the app. And I created a space that was LGBT inclusive, that was sex positive, that had womanist and feminist theology, that really reflected... Ooh, what's the, the difference between womanist and feminist? Womanist is black and uh, has Latin roots. Yes. Okay. Theology, black, female, Latin female theology. Sorry, I threw you off. No. Um, I created something that reflected the Christianity that I saw in the world, 
that had the theology that I knew existed in this holy book that had been weaponized against me and my people. Mm -hmm. And I continue to publish on that platform. And it's honestly the greatest work I could ever do with my life. Like, I am so excited that I get to do this work. And so I guess I, I stopped feeling like I needed to tell the homophobes they were wrong, you know, mm -hmm. stand in their face and, and yell at them and prove point for point how they're wrong. And instead just like own my space and be like, well, this exists. So please move on. <laughs> I'm not fighting with you. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever still feel like fighting? With them? Mm. I don't have the time. I do not. I do not. Like a lot of times on our Instagram, we'll get those comments of mm -hmm. people who just want to fight and I just delete them and I block them because they have no room here. Mm. Mm -mm. Okay. So that, that was about you and your religion. I wrote something down before because I thought it sounded really pretty when you said it, which is I was going to stretch into my sexuality. Mm. Do you feel as though... You've done that. Yeah. I have, against my um, upbringing, been extremely open-minded about what my desires could be and what my capacity for love could be. And, you know, I have tried one-night stands and long-term relationships, and I have dated and been with trans people and non-binary people and I have tried open relationships and dating multiple people and I think that all of that has led me to a place where I, I know what I want sexually and I think that is leaps and bounds above anything the person in the other vision was ever, ever, ever going to get. I can honestly say that this version of Crystal has had way more orgasms than the Crystal in, in the other version, for damn sure. <laughs> you know, I think that being queer just, I mean, enables you to, to, to really get to know yourself very well. And sorry to segue from your orgasms to your mom, but <laughs> you've just said something that sparked in me, you know, the fact that you grew up in a really... It, it, you grew up in a religion that was very, like, gay, bad, promiscuity, bad, yes. don't do these things. Purity culture. And so my assumption is that your mother introduced you to that religion and that your mother was also part of that religion. Well, have there been teething problems at all? I know you said that she was quite, like, chill when you came out, but... <sighs> I am so fortunate to have the mother that I have. I mean, for one thing, she is from Zambia, Africa. And so not only was she conservative, but also she was Zambian African conservative, um, daughter of a missionary conservative. Oh, wow. And she has had her own metamorphosis. The biggest leaps happened after my dad died. And by the time that I came out, she was in such a healed and open place that she heard me. I'm not saying it didn't scare the living daylights out of her. Mm. We went two weeks without talking when I was trying to figure out, okay, where am I going to live now? Because this is crazy. I can't live like this. Oh, um, oh, so you were just in the same house, not talking to one another. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so painful. Um, to me, you know, having a dinner with her and she's like, are you really gay? And she's like... I really thought that any one of your brothers could be gay, but I never thought you. And I was like, seriously, look, I, w I am a tomboy to a T. Um, and, you know, the next day I'm dropping her off at work and she's like, so tell me, what kind of gay are you? Are you um, Ellen gay or Chaz Bono gay? And I'm like, oh, my God, that's oh. a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother thing. Oh. <laughs> um, but, yeah, she she figured out that, my mom decided that she was going to love me. And she was actually the one who went and told her sisters that I was gay, who told their husbands, who told their, my cousins. And all I really had to do was come out to my brothers. And, you know, since then it has been 
a road of discovery, but there was never a time where I didn't feel mm. in my household that I wasn't loved and affirmed and accepted. And yeah, I got really lucky. But I do have a half sister who's very homophobic and I do have some extended family who are are never going to get there. And, you know, they don't need to. I am who I am. What, do, do you have any relationship with that sister or is it just... We just don't talk. She has continued to try, and every time she tries, she hurts me. And so, yeah, I have, in the past six months, I've cut off communication. Mm, that's hard, but it sounds like that's the best decision. Yeah. She is not, she's not privy to access to me. Mm-hmm. So that's on her. Until she can do her research and... and do her own growth, I'm not going to do it for her and I'm not going to be a punching bag. Mm. We haven't talked a lot about sisters. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the obvious answer is it lost a lesbian bar, but what did Philadelphia lose when it lost sisters? Oh, I just feel like it lost a hub of culture and a great place for queer folk to meet and to be able to see themselves in other people. It lost some amazing bartenders and just, yeah, it was a great stomping ground. I I miss it so much. I really do. So then if you were, oh, okay, I should actually warn you before we get into this. This Mm -hmm. is the super cheesy portion of the conversation. So I know you don't remember the very first time that you ever went to Sisters, but let's just say for a second you you do. And I want you to think about that night and that version of Crystal that's going through the front door of Sisters. And I also want you to think of you in your current form. I'm making this really complicated. You in your current form being there. And you get a chance to talk to her and give her some advice. What would you say? I think the first thing I would say to that baby crystal is don't date Nisha. Oh, yeah. Nisha, no. (laughs) Stay away from Nisha. Oh, yeah. I mean, we all have our exes, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Gosh, what would I tell her? What would I tell her? I feel like for me, it was all about the discovery. It was all about living in the moment and having the adventure. Um, I think that I would just tell her that it was okay. I think back then I just kind of felt like a raw nerve. And Mm -hmm. I was so embarrassed about where I'd found myself. So embarrassed that I believed these ridiculous 27 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I felt ridiculous that my sexual experience was so limited and that I had let it get to that point. I felt embarrassed that that I wasn't experienced with alcohol. I just, I felt like this, I, like I stuck out mm-hmm. in a room and that I stuck out in conversation because I, did, I didn't even have reference for like a lot of pop culture because of how I grew up. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely tell her that nobody's watching, <laughs> nobody's paying attention and that it's okay. Oh, it's that thing, isn't it? Like, this is really depressing, but also really liberating. No one cares about you. <laughs> yeah, nobody, nobody cares. And there's a lot more people in your corner than not in your corner. Mm. Um, a lot of that that gawky sister stage of my life was a lot of trying to prove myself to other people and then being disappointed when I didn't, you know. It's a lot of self-discovery more than needing to prove myself to other people. Do you have any memories of sisters or maybe clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, you know what I'm going to say, right? I'm going to say, why not get in touch? I plan to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing, but I need your help in order to do that. Go to lostspacespodcast.com, find the section, share a lost space, and then tell me 
me all about what it is you got up to. I would love to hear from you. And if that's maybe a step too far and you want to get in touch otherwise, why not get in touch on Facebook or Instagram where my handle is Lost Spaces Pod. Find out more about Crystal by following her on X at Crystal Cheatham or visiting her website, crystalcheatham.me. Or if you liked the sound of our Bible, which is the app we were discussing in today's episode, why not go and download it and get a daily devotional daily? You get that daily, the daily devotional daily. Yeah, I probably should have practiced this. Anyway, if you like this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on your podcast platform of choice, or just told other people who you think might be interested in giving it a listen to and maybe getting a little kick out of these stories that we're sharing. My name's Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.